one, uh, my next talk is about uh, DVT and superficial venous thrombosis. What differentiates superficial clots from deep clots is basically the fascia. Superficial veins are superficial to the fascia. Deep veins are deep to the fascia. You know the sort of names of these things. I'm not going to go through that in too much detail. Small saphenous, greater saphenous, you know all these things. Superficial thrombophlebitis, have you, you've seen, I'm sure, superficial thrombophlebitis. So it's, it's relatively common. It's usually in the, in the saphenous vein. It's more common in patients who have varicosities just because they've got more stasis and they have abnormal endothelium. The inside of the veins have usually been to some degree abnormal. Probably a little more common in women, but it's not a huge difference. Um, more common in older patients, that's probably true. Uh, certainly uh, the stasis associated with pregnancy sort of is a, is a risk factor for it. Doesn't seem like we see it as much as we used to. I, I'm not exactly sure why, but it, it, it's certainly around. Uh, risk of uh, superficial thrombophlebitis in patients who don't have cancer, or autoimmune disease, or varicose veins. Factor V Leiden, what, what is factor V Leiden? What does that mean? What, what is factor V Leiden? What's, what, how is it different than factor V Houston? <laughs> or someplace else? There actually are several factor V Leidens. So it's a point mutation factor V, one amino acid, where protein, activated protein C doesn't inhibit it. It's not inhibitable by activated protein C. So again, your endogenous anticoagulation system that's dependent on thrombin and thrombomodulin and endothelial cells that really work, uh, those people are not anticoagulatable by their own, one of the most important anticoagulants in your system is activated protein C. So factor V Leiden increases the risk a little bit. What's 2210A? What is that all about? If you got uh, prothrombin 2210A, yeah. So again, it's, you cleave it, and it's just not—it's not quite as if, uh, uh, as as, in, as inhibitable as uh, the conventional prothrombin. Antithrombin three. A lot of the clotters have quit calling it three; they just call it antithrombin. Uh, if you if you have deficiencies of protein C, protein S, or antithrombin, those are all those endogenous anticoagulants that shift you more towards a, a bleeding state. Uh, what about DVT? And as a superficial thrombophlebitis. So the real question that you have to face is, what, what's the chance that if somebody has a red-hot tender streak on their calf that anybody could figure out that's a clot in a superficial vein, what's the chance they've got DVT? We used to just routinely just kind of put these people on ibuprofen and forget about them. Turns out there's a 25 or 20 percent chance that they will have contiguous deep vein thrombosis. So typically in the person with superficial thrombophlebitis, that's remote from the deep system, meaning it's like out on your calf someplace, then typically treating those people kind of symptomatically is pretty reasonable. But if they've got a superficial clot that's adjacent to or approaching, encroaching on the deep system, so the small saphenous vein behind the knee that's getting to the popliteal, or a great saphenous vein where you're in the thigh, so you're within a few centimeters, and whether you call it five centimeters or three or whatever, but if it's your feeling that you're likely to propagate into the deep system, then it's reasonable to anticoagulate people. I don't typically anticoagulate superficial phlebitis that's not encroaching on the deep venous system, but if it, but if it is, then you probably should anticoagulate. And oftentimes the physical findings of superficial phlebitis will not reflect the duplex findings. So there'll be more, the red hot swelling and tender will be more in the part of the thing that was the oldest. So you might have superficial phlebitis in the, in the saphenous vein around the knee, but when you, by clinical exam, but when you ultrasound them, there's clot that's actually a lot more proximal than that. So in my, we used to not to even get duplex scans in people with superficial phlebitis, but I think that's probably a bad idea. So when you see, if you see somebody with superficial phlebitis, get a duplex scan. If they've got clot that's encroaching on the deep system or actually involving the deep system at that moment, go ahead and anticoagulate them. Classic symptoms, rubor, dolor, calor, and tumor, and diagnosis, go ahead and get a duplex.
treatments, again, NSAIDs for the most part, doesn't hurt anybody, compression stockings, you're not going to squeeze this stuff out. Nobody's going to wear compression stockings with acute superficial phlebitis because it's too damn tender to put the stocking on. Uh, that's really more related to once they resolve their acute event uh, than to decrease recurrence. You know, people who've got varicosities, they've had phlebitis in the past, when they take long plane flights or they're driving to El Paso, put on some stockings and maybe even take a little Lovenox. Heating pads, I'm not sure what heating pads do. I think a lot of that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use electric heating pads really on anybody that you'll, you'll, you'll advise somebody to use an electric heating pad and they'll come in with a waffle burn on their leg. Uh, hot rags, you know, take a towel and heat it and put it on, probably does increase a little blood flow to the skin and it probably accelerates healing a little bit. I think a lot of times these kind of, uh, Treatments like hot pads and things are really to give patients something to do while nature is doing whatever it was going to do. And, but it makes you seem therapeutic. You know, you got a white coat and all that stuff. You're supposed to come in and do something, and you give them a very precise prescription. You know, every morning, soak your towel, put it on for 10 minutes, and at noon, do it again. At 5, it's got to be right at 5 o'clock, do it again, and then right before bed. So you give them specific instructions that makes them feel like they're contributing to their healing as opposed to just giving them an antibiotic and some opioid. <laughs> Switch to uh, deep vein thrombosis. Uh, uh, Sheila's going to talk in a little more detail here in a second. Good morning. Uh, about uh, uh, PE, but in, in terms of DVT, most patients, uh, I mean, it's just basically people you're going to see, most of them have got DVT versus uh, PE. Uh, some of those PEs, you won't have been able to detect DVT because you get the ultrasound, it's negative because the clot ain't in the leg anymore, it's in the lung. Uh, I'm not sure I believe these numbers that 6% of patients who have DVT die within a month and 10% with PE die within a month. I mean, it may be true, but most of those people who did die within a month probably deserve to die. I mean, they, uh, they were already sick. You know, it's not like it was just the DVT snuck up on them and assaulted them in the hallway. Uh, they, were, they were sick people with underlying cause, and it wasn't that big a surprise. Age is a big problem. You know, you get older, stuff stops working very well, and uh, there's no question. You start getting over 40, and your risk factor for DVT, it's one of the bigger ones. You know, you got cancer, you got immobility, you got other you know, procoagulant states, but age is a really significant uh, risk factor. Modifiable risk factors, this is interesting, obesity. Uh, is a significant risk factor for DVT that is, I guess in theory, it's modifiable. Uh, estrogens and progestins, that's a tricky one, especially in the, in the heavier woman. Uh, you can see the estrogens are not quite as severe a risk for DVT in the, in the non-overweight woman. Uh, it's not clear that modifying homocysteine levels with vitamin B really have any significant impact. I mean, they have, there have been lots of studies on reducing uh, homocysteine levels with vitamin B, and it hadn't really had a lot of impact in most uh, settings. Temporary risk factors for DVT, you know, it, it happens on both the medical service and the surgical service. The heart failure patients are probably the biggest group in the medical service that ought to be anticoagulated. You know, for years they just didn't treat any patient, didn't do any DVT prophylaxis on the medical side of the hospital. Uh, but then it became pretty clear that some of those patients were also getting uh, DVT. Uh, cancer, risk of DVT within six months after the diagnosis, significant, especially for the uh, metastatic cancer in the bone, hormone therapy, a bit of a problem, cancer, in fact, a 5 lydenin prothrombin gene, 2210A, that's a bad combination. Travel, four or more hours supposedly increase the risk pretty significantly. So a lot of patients, if I've had, if they've got, you know, if they've had a history of DVT, but they're not currently being treated, uh, if I had that situation, I probably would take uh, Lovenox. I'd take a shot of Lovenox, get on a plane and go go to wherever I'm going, Saudi Arabia, before I get ready to go, take another shot of Lovenox on the flight back. It's simple, it's easy, and it gives you a little insurance that during that long period of stasis, because reasonably, let's face it, on planes today, there's just not enough room to get up every 10 minutes or 30 minutes and try to walk around, uh, that it uh, probably is worth doing, and it's a good, simple piece of insurance, I think, for these people. Uh, genetic factors, loss of coagulation disor disorders, less common, more potent disorders. Uh, 
a deficiency in endogenous anticoagulants, again, like antithrombin or protein C, protein S. You know, one of the things you need to remember is people come in and they'll get a, uh, they'll have a DVT and somebody will say, do a hypercoag workup, do a coag workup. You can do things like antibodies, so you can look at prothrombin gene, because that's not dependent on their coagulation action. It's not a functional test, it's a genetic test. And you can do factor V Leiden because it's a genetic test. But you can't measure stuff like antithrombin and protein C and protein S in the midst of a thrombotic event, because those things are getting consumed. And I think a lot of patients come in the hospital now, you guys send a lab test, and, and it comes back, functional protein S deficiency, and then they get labeled as a hypercoagulable patient as a protein S deficiency. It's probably the most common one that gets labeled. In reality, all they did was they had a clot. It had nothing to do with protein S deficiency. They were just using up their protein S in the process of having clots. And now you got them stuck with a, you know, with a, with a hypercoagulable state that they probably don't have. So in reality, if you're going to do a hypercoagulable workup on somebody with acute deep vein thrombosis, you should wait until they're in a stable state. And you can do that even in a, somebody who's on an anticoagulant. If you're three months out, you're on an anticoagulant, you can compare factor 10 levels, for instance, to the uh, protein C or protein S. These are all vitamin K dependent factors, so you should be able to be on warfarin, for instance, and still be able to have a ratio and see are all of your factors being de su de suppressed at the same level, or do you have one that's out of whack, like protein S is really low. So again, it's, it's not usually a good idea to measure functional levels, AT3, protein C, protein S, in the midst of a coagulation event, it's better to wait until they're in a stable state. And they, again, they can be in a stable state of anticoagulation to check that stuff. Pathogenesis, that's supposedly an angioscope showing platelets or something. I, I, I don't know what exactly that is. It could be anything, really. It's uh, something in a blood vessel with some little stalactites in there. But the idea is that platelets, and you know, for years they said aspirin had no impact on reducing the risk of DVT. It probably does. It probably is a weak, uh, has a weak effect on reducing the risk. Thrombus location. Uh, most of the clots in your legs occur most distally because that's where blood hangs around is more static. And it becomes more relevant when you have proximal propagation. Clinical diagnosis of DVT, you know, the bottom line is the clinical diagnosis of just physical exam is just not very accurate. So you got to have a duplex scan. Just, you don't have to really remember anything else, but the clinical diagnosis is sort of 50-50 accurate in diagnosis of DVT. 50% of patients who you think have DVT don't when you do a duplex. 50% of the patients you don't think have it have it when you actually do the duplex. So it's just one of those situations where you're... No matter how savvy you are as a clinician, you're not likely to be able to diagnose DVT without ultrasound. And ultrasound is by far and away the test of choice. Do you need to do caffeine uh, compression? Uh, you know, different labs do it different ways. Some labs will do a whole leg venous duplex where they compress all the caffeines. Uh, some labs will only do above the knee. And it, it turns out the stuff that really matters is popliteal, femoral, common femoral. That's what really matters. And so, and you can do that yourself. So if you get called to the emergency room to see somebody with a swollen leg, if you compress the popliteal vein, you don't see clot, and you compress the common femoral, you don't see clot, particularly in people who have a relatively low D-dimer, you can pretty much say they don't have clinically relevant DVT. The chance, for instance, that they've got isolated clot out in the middle of their femoral vein and not in the popliteal or common femoral is stunningly low. Most people will have DVT in the common femoral vein or popliteal as, as, in terms of clinical relevance. So uh, you don't necessarily have to do caffeine uh, compression. D-dimer, where do you get D-dimer from? I know Spence knows because I told him the other day. How do you get D-dimer? What, what factor uh, do you have to, what functional coagulation factor do you have to have to eventually have to be able to get D-dimer? You got to have factor 13. Factor 13 is what allows these monomers to cross-link. So you have A, B, C, D is like fibrin and fibrin monomers and they click together. And when you cut those up enzymatically, you can't have double Ds unless you've got cross-linking by factor 13. So a D-dimer means you've got mature clot that's being degraded. And if you, for instance, if you had somebody on anticoagulation for a period of time, and you're trying to decide, should I stop their anticoagulation at three months or six months? If you check their D-dimer and they still got elevated D-dimer, 
Well, that means they've got an ongoing thrombotic process because as soon as you start making clot, you also start degrading it. You know, your, your plasmin is, is active. It may not be enough to get rid of all the clot, but you, as soon as you start making clot, you start degrading it. So D-dimer is, is a sign of ongoing thrombotic activity. The well score is a way to sort of kind of classify people's risk. In, in reality, almost any patient you're going to see is going to have at least one point because it, it, you know, when you go to see somebody in the emergency room, practically everybody's uh, been laying around or they've got some localized tenderness. So it's it really, you get down to, you have to be just totally clean in terms of risk if you do a well score, which is sort of a clinical probability score for the detection of DVT. But if you do have multiple points, you got cancer and you've been laying in bed, well, you got a pretty good chance that your swollen leg is related to DVT. Who do you admit with DVT? Why do you admit somebody for DVT? And if they're symptomatic, yeah. I mean, really, you've got two different diseases. One is DVT, the other is a big swollen leg. If you have a big, painful, swollen leg, the reason you're being admitted is to elevate the leg. The treatment for a big, swollen leg is elevation. The treatment for DVT is anticoagulation. They're not really connected. If you have DVT but you don't have a big swollen leg, there's no real reason to be in a hospital laying in bed. In fact, the worst thing you can do is admit somebody to the hospital, put them at bed rest, and not effectively anticoagulate them. And there was a big study done, oh, 15 or 20 years ago, where they looked at people who were effectively anticoagulated by measuring their PTT. And if you didn't get an effectively elevated PTT within the first 24 hours, those people had worse outcomes in terms of recurrent thrombotic events or, or, or other thrombotic events. So in and of itself, bed rest is not a good treatment for DVT. Being up and around and walking is a good thing, plus anticoagulation. So the reason you really need to admit people is if they've got a big swollen leg. You're treating the swollen leg, not the DVT fundamentally. Initial treatment for almost everybody nowadays would be low molecular weight heparin and then switch them over to something else. Uh, initial treatment, uh, when do you do catheter thrombolysis? Uh, that's a tough question. I, I think uh, Sheila will talk a little bit about it with, D, with the pulmonary embolism. You know, uh, I'm going to jump to that just right at the end. I think about lysis for acute DVT mainly in people who are relatively young. Old people have a big risk. I mean, I was treating a woman in Greenville not a couple of years ago. I'm thinking she's like 68, she's pretty healthy. She started complaining of headache at the first 24-hour check. And uh, by the time we finished the case, she wasn't just complaining of headache. She was, like, out. And she had a massive uh, bleed in her cerebellum. Fortunately, there was a neurosurgeon that was, like, a really good guy, and he took her straight to the operating room, decompressed the whole thing, and she walked out of the hospital. But I don't think that's the routine. We had a death in Dallas in an 80-year-old woman getting lysis not very, about three weeks ago. So lysis in old people, caution. That's all I would say, flashing red light. Caution, lysis in old people. 25-year-old woman, she's three weeks postpartum, everything else is fine, she's otherwise healthy, she wants to return to being a long-distance runner, uh, you know, she has no ongoing risk factors, it's her first time for DVT. That's probably the person where lysis really becomes appealing. So the young, healthy, first-timer, uh, no ongoing thrombotic risk. That's where I kind of think lysis is probably the most you know, useful. The other is the location of the clot. Clot in your calf it probably doesn't make a bit of difference long-term functionally. Iliofemoral DVT does. Your real goal with lysis is to connect the profunda vein to the cava. If you can get the profunda connected to the cava, you're probably not going to have very significant symptoms regardless of what the status of your femoral vein in the thigh is. So, for instance, we know pretty well we can take out the femoral vein and use it for a reconstruction of the aorta, and people have hardly any swelling at all, right? As long as your profunda veins are, 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 are patent, just taking out a piece of the, the femoral vein in the mid-thigh adjacent to the fem superficial femoral artery, not very morbid. So I don't really care about treating the femoral vein Personally, when I lice, I mainly focus on profunda, getting the profunda connected to the cava with some flow. 
So I used to mostly approach my DVT license from the popliteal face down, trying to go up that way. I've actually shifted over the last few years, and I tend to go femoral vein so I can kind of go up and over. By doing that, I can get into the profunda. If you come from the popliteal, you never really treat the profunda vein. So there is some, it's something to think about. And I don't know, you'll, you'll hear attendings are going to have different approaches to this. But I kind of, there's a guy over in Greenville named Bruce Gray, really savvy interventionalist. And he convinced me that the up and over technique in a femoral position in a, in a patient supine as opposed to being prone, which is another big pain in the ass, by the way, trying to do prone patients. They don't really like it all that much. But uh, having a patient supine work in femoral vein is a pretty easy and it's a very effective way to treat patients. So anyway, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. All right. John, thank you so much.